Um, it's a pleasure to be here, and uh, it's nice for me to get a little bit of time out of the lab. Um, normally, I'm, you know, doing CSI type work, uh, but in the diagnostic lab at UK, it's just a little bit less glamorous. Uh, that's my lab in a busy day in the summertime. And I do work on all crops, so you can see a variety there spread out all over the, uh, the laboratory. And trees and shrubs, I, I end up spending probably um, about half my time on, whether that's from uh, landscape, uh, installations or from nurseries, probably a lot more from landscapes after they make it into the landscape. So it, um, it's certainly something that keeps me very busy and it's also a difficult um, diagnostic problem, a little bit more difficult with the diagnostic process when you have to um, work with, some, with something, a large plant that you don't have the whole uh, plant to look at. Uh, just, just to put things in perspective, uh, this is from last year, and we had, in my lab alone, just the Lexington lab and not Princeton, we had uh, 260 different types of plants that we looked at, and they can have many different kinds of diseases, so it does keep us on our toes a little bit. Uh, all sizes and shapes keeps us, keeps us going. But the process is really the same, and that's what I want to talk to you all about, is how, uh, how I work as a diagnostician and how also you, I'm sure, work as diagnosticians as well in your, uh, in your business, in landscape maintenance. I noticed that a lot of you work uh, in maintenance, and that's always going to be part of your responsibility, is trying to figure out what's going on when there's a problem. And the process is going to be the same, whether you're in a laboratory working on very small seedlings, or whether you're out in a landscape working on large trees, or in a nursery as well. First of all, we need to figure out what the problem is. And a lot of times you may get a call from a client, uh, or you may be scouting your own nursery and you'll see something and you'll first of all wonder is what's going on here? It doesn't quite look right and that's where understanding what plants are supposed to look like at certain times of year is very important. For you all that's probably old hat and you, and you know that but I think uh, probably a lot of times for those of you especially who work uh, in landscape maintenance and work with turf, uh, clients will see problems where maybe there's really not one there. So understanding what things are supposed to look like is a good starting point. Once you realize that there is a problem, then we wanna learn to look very closely at the symptoms and, and also sometimes the signs of disease or damage. And that's what I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about. And I'll talk about some uh, specific diseases that I think will be are important for most of us to know about. And others, we'll just talk about the process of how we can do this. We wanna look at those, not only the symptoms and signs, but we wanna look at patterns that we see in the landscape landscape setting, in a nursery setting, because that can very often tell us a whole lot about what's going on. Uh, also we want to look for those patterns that occur over time, and that's very important for identifying diseases and differentiating them between the diseases, infectious problems, and disorders or nutritional type environmental problems. And so we'll, we'll proceed on, and I think um, I drew up a little uh, flow chart because I think this is a helpful way to get yourself oriented when you're trying to, to go through this diagnostic process because we really want to look at the whole plant. In your uh, line of work, that's what you're going to be doing all the time. In mine, I have to imagine the whole plant sometimes. I'm just getting very small parts of it, and it makes it a lot more difficult, but I'm always thinking about what's the whole, why, are the, why, are, why are these symptoms showing up, and what do they mean about the whole plant? So if we start off and we see foliar symptoms on the whole plant, if we see leaf spots or blotches, irregular areas of dead tissue, then we're going to check for foliar disease. And this is going to be probably the most straightforward part of it. And uh, as, as I think we'll find when we go uh, do our, our walking uh, tour in the afternoon, with, uh, with Dave as well, that those foliar problems, you still have to do some, uh, some very careful observation to figure out, okay, what's causing these foliar symptoms. But I think if we have the spots and blotches and uh, dead areas on the leaves, we're gonna check for foliar diseases. If we see things that are a little less specific like that, uh, such as marginal burn, scorching, wilting, things like that, we're gonna look somewhere else on the plant. We're gonna uh, maybe check for problems lower down. 
if we see yellowing stunting, uh, thinning of a canopy, that's going to lead us probably to, again, problems lower down, problems that have to do with the environment, the planting site, and things like that. So let's start with this, uh, these foliar diseases first, and there's a huge variety of foliar fungal diseases. There are also some bacterial diseases that we'll see. There's lots and lots of insect pests that cause very similar symptoms. So just recognizing that this is uh, um, that these spots are abnormal, I think we can all agree with that, and then when we see them, honing those skills that we have to try to figure out, okay, what might be the cause? What are some of the, the important features to notice in this array of pictures? All of these are foliar fungal diseases. Um, they're caused by different fungi on different plant hosts, but there are some similarities, and I think that it's important for us to take note of those. Notice for one thing, these spots are very irregular. We don't see a very specific, a regular pattern of spots all over the leaf. We see them concentrated here along the edges. Uh, sometimes we see the leaf spotting hugging the veins. So we're, sh we're seeing some random or irregular pattern. We also, if we look closely at these, at these spots, we might see that there is a halo or a border around the dead area. You can see that on the picture in the, uh, in the center there. And also on this, um, this one, you see a very nice kind of yellow halo. And those are uh, symptoms that make us lean towards probably an infectious problem, an infectious disease, rather than leaf spots that are caused by some other environmental uh, factor or something like that. We also can look closely at leaf spots and maybe see little fungal fruiting structures. And I'm going to show you some of those at the end of this presentation because I have a little gadget that I want to demo for you. But being able to recognize that we're seeing random spotting and that we maybe are seeing some features such as this uh, halo effect is important. And here's another, uh, another very good image of um, foliar symptoms. See, we have a re relatively irregular spotting on those leaves and some of those little yellow halos to show that it um, tends to be symptoms of a fungal disease. And most of the time, these foliar diseases are cosmetic. <clears throat> so in a nursery setting, we don't like to have them, but we want to, um, we want to balance our concern over them versus the the importance of actually controlling them. So most of the time these are going to be cosmetic and they can be managed in such a way that, um, that we don't expend a lot of chemicals or uh, anything like that. Uh, in the landscape, same thing. Even though our clients may be very unhappy with spots and funny looking leaves, very often they're not doing anything to the overall health of the tree. And furthermore, most of the time when we see foliar problems, it's too late to treat them. We would have to remember and treat them preventively the next year. So, so when we see those symptoms, very often it's more a matter of educating your clients that this is not something we can control now, but we want to keep this on the, on the docket for next year. So looking a little bit closer to identify some of the fungal uh, diseases, because that's more common certainly than bacterial diseases uh, in most cases, we want to look closely at those, at those spotted areas because you can have lots of different things that cause uh, leaf spotting. If we use a hand lens or this little gadget that I'll, I'll demo here in a little bit, um, this one's wind. It's called a proscope and it's just a little, um, um, little magnifier that hooks onto your iPhone or an iPad and it's pretty it's pretty neat I'm not very adept at using it yet because I haven't used it very much but it's kind of a souped up hand lens and it allows you to take pictures so I really like that and it has a light on it so we'll demo that at the end but with some sort of magnifier it's very it's pretty easy really to be able to see some features that you just can't see with your, just with your eye. So this is the leaf anthracnose on oaks. And if we look closely at some of those, those dead areas, we can see these little fungal structures. With a microscope that I would use in the laboratory, I can identify the spores, measure them, and, and exact, um, get a confirmation on the fungus. But 
for um, field scouting, really using a hand lens, a proscope, or something like that, you should be able to see those little uh, fungal structures, and that'll give you a better idea that yes, I am dealing with a fungal disease, and here's what I'm gonna do about it. There's also some insect activity going on there. Didn't miss that, Dave. Okay, the other thing that I want to point out about foliar diseases, we're talking about looking very closely at these little spots and blotches, but a lot of times what's really going to give you the, the best idea of what's going on in a, uh, in a landscape or a nursery setting is not so much the looking very closely, it's the looking at the big picture. And that's what I really like to encourage. That's where I'm at a disadvantage in a laboratory. I'm, I'm depending on other people to give me the information that I need to, um, to be able to, to figure out what's going on. And I have a lot of tools where I can look for those little tiny fungal structures and I have a lot of experience in recognizing them. But what I don't get to see is the overall picture. And this I think is very important, especially in, in positions like you're in, where you're in the field uh, trying to monitor diseases. Um, thinning foliage, that progresses from the lower canopy upward doesn't always mean it's a foliar disease or an infectious disease, but a lot of times it does. Most of our foliar fungal diseases do progress upward. So we'll see something like this. These are trees that had a pretty bad case of anthracnose early in the spring, and notice that the only leaves that are even left on the tree are in the very top. So this is a pattern to just keep in your mind. If we see a pattern of foliar symptoms starting on the outside of the canopy and in the top, it usually means there's something else going on. Foliar fungal diseases especially tend to move from the bottom, um, from the bottom up. And here's another diagram to show you this. This is a disease we've been seeing quite a lot of uh, in the diagnostic lab, probably over about the last five years. It's a needle cast disease of spruces. Um, and we'll see this type of pattern. You'll see lower uh, canopy casting of the needles. And it will work its way up. And that's just because that humidity in the canopy stays uh, pretty intense longer and that helps the fungus to sporulate. And we also have the source of fungal infections down here with, this, with these cast needles. That's where the new infections are coming from. So if you think about why that's occurring, I think it'll make more sense to you. Other things can also cause uh, needle casting or symptoms that move up from the lower canopy. And this afternoon or later this morning, we'll hear about probably some insects that do that too. But at least this gives you an idea of the types of things to look for when you see that pattern. And then with a hand lens, this is the same needle cast disease that we see on spruces. I've seen lots of it in landscapes. Uh, in the nursery when we were walking around yesterday, I didn't see any of this, but uh, certainly in landscapes, we've been seeing a lot of it for several years. And if you look closely at the individual needles using a hand lens, proscope, or something like that, some kind of magnifier, you probably will be able to see those little black structures along the needle, which indicate that that's the fungal disease. In the laboratory, we confirm it using a regular microscope. Okay, so what about other types of symptoms that we're, that we're seeing? Foliar symptoms that have led us in one direction, uh, looking for foliar diseases. What about branch uh, symptoms when we're looking at the whole plant, when we see dead branches, not just spotted leaves or something like that or yellowing? What if we see individual dead branches? Well, usually a pattern of scattered dead branches, uh, if we see that, see dieback, sometimes we will actually see visible cankers. And the, a canker is a localized dead area, can be very sunken, uh, can have the target shape that's very recognizable, and it can also be very, very subtle and difficult to see. Uh, and I'll show you some pictures of that. So if we see the visible cankers and we're gonna find out what kind of canker disease it is, sometimes that involves getting a lab confirmation, sometimes you can, you can figure that out on your own. Sometimes we'll see dieback of individual branches without any kind of visible uh, dead area or canker. And then we're going to go in the other direction and we're going to think about possible problems lower down with the roots, with the base of the plant. 
So cankers, canker diseases which are infectious, tend to have an irregular pattern similar to the leaf spot um, pattern that we talked about, scattered branches. And we usually can trace a dead branch back and find uh, that sunken or um, sort of roughened area where we see the canker and when we would want to prune that well below the cankered area no matter what kind of uh, fungus or bacterium is causing it. Sometimes we can use our hand lens and we can see those little uh, fungal fruiting structures that are little uh, bumps that, that erupt out of the bark. And one important thing to remember, and we've been seeing a lot of this in the past few years, uh, lots and lots of uh, cankers have to have a stress factor to predispose them. So this is something you'd really want to look at in the landscape and also in nurseries. You want to find out what's really going on that's made this tree more susceptible to a canker disease. I'll show you some pictures of that. Um, and this one is one that I am completely sick of <laughs> this year. Um, cankers on Leyland Cypress. I don't know how many of you grow those. If you work in a landscape, if you do landscape maintenance and you have worked in landscapes with, with a Leland Cypress this year, you've seen it because uh, we really, <laughs> I don't think there's one in the state of Kentucky that doesn't have a little bit of cankering this year. So the Leland Cypress, notice the, the picture of the whole plant. So we didn't know anything about this plant. We would at least see this picture or see even better if we were out in the site and we see this scattered dieback of branches. There's a branch there, there, up in the top. So it's very, it's very irregular looking, right? We see something like that, that's a, that's a good clue that we want to look for um, a canker disease. And if we look closely at the affected branches, in this case, and I know that's a, not a very good picture, but I think you can still appreciate that we have a little bit of a discolored area in that, um, in that zone between the dead foliage and the live foliage back here. And also, in some cases, like this disease, we'll see some oozing of sap uh, or resin in this area, and it's a little bit roughened. We also see uh, a little stump of a twig that was infected first, and the canker fungus moves down into the, into the main branch. So this one, the ceridium canker, the ceridium is just the name of the fungus that causes it. We've seen actually four, uh, pretty frequently, four different canker fungi in Leland Cypress this year in the lab. And when we get the samples and we see those symptoms, we don't know which fungus it is. And it probably doesn't matter that much. I'm curious to see which fungi are really active, um, but really, it's not so important that which fungus it is, it's more important what the symptoms are showing us about this, um, about this type of disease. Also, why do we see this? Why am I, why have, am I sick to death of Leland Cypress this year? Mm -hmm. The four, going back, the mm -hmm. four cankers you see, do they all look the same? They look pretty much the same, yeah. Uh, the ceridium canker has a little bit more oozing of that resin. Uh, Botryosphyria canker is the other one, if you want to know that, uh, and Cytospora canker. And they're going to look pretty similar, but with a little bit less oozing. And Phomopsis is another one, and that's more of a twig blight, a little bit more of a twig blight. But they're all caused by fungi, and they're all very much predisposed by stress, stress conditions. So what stressed out the Leyland cypresses? Winter. That winter we had was horrible. And they're marginally hardy. That's that's a you know that's a species that's uh, done very well in Kentucky for a while. Then we had a you know an Illinois type winter, and it's it's it hasn't done as well. And uh, we've definitely seen a lot of that. We've also uh, and and in cases where the the cankering is not too advanced, they can be pruned out. But in some cases, we've really seen quite a bit of of branch loss in these. And so that's something I'm definitely um, gotten my fill of this year. 
and there's a little bit close up of this. This is a, a picture of the canker, and it's really, it's not a nice target shaped canker that you can recognize very quickly. But if you will trace the dead ba branch back towards the trunk, at some point you'll find a little bit of a sunken spot with this oozing. Now there are other things that cause resin to ooze out of um, conifer branches, but usually that it will be a sort of roughened area. And if you take a, a pocket knife and shave away the bark, you can usually find trace back till you come to the point where you have a juncture between live and dead tissue. And that's, that's also very helpful. That's usually where the fungus is living. And under uh, the microscope, we see a certain type of spore, and that's the kind of work you would have to use microscopy to do. But uh, probably in some of these cases, it would be, especially in a nursery setting, it would be a good idea to find out which fungus you're dealing with. Ceridium is very specific uh, to um, Leyland cypress and, and very closely related conifers. Botryosphyria, which is another type of fungus, we can see on any, just about any type of tree, including uh, um, hardwood trees, shade trees, not conifers. Okay, and here I'll, now I'm back on Botryosphyria canker, and we see this on all types of plants. This one's a very much of a generalist uh, fungus. The pattern, though, is the same. Scattered dead branches, here I have uh, showing that juncture between the live and dead tissue uh, that you can see when you take the bark away. And here, I don't know if you can see that very well, but we have little, those little uh, bumps, the little fungal fruiting bodies, and this is on rhododendron, but we can see this on a lot of different hosts. And the pattern, uh, this is an old picture because, you know, the ash tree probably wouldn't have Botryosphyria canker anymore, <laughs> probably wouldn't. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> so imagine that's a different kind of tree. Uh, notice the scattered branch dieback. This was a, probably 10 years ago. We had a, uh, a heavy drought, a, a extreme drought in one year. The next year, we'd see a lot of this canker. That's the stress that predisposed plants. And if we cut the, the bark away, we can see, start to see a juncture between the live and dead tissue. And in this case, also following a drought, uh, on oak, we can see that little sunken area on the, on the tips of the twigs. And another canker that we've seen quite a bit of, also on the Leyland cypresses, and particularly on spruces, is Cytospora canker. And it's, the symptoms are going to be very similar. Scattered branch dieback, this sort of resinous, rough area, that's the canker, and if you're really uh, good with the hand lens or send it into the lab, there are little fungal structures that are gonna uh, emerge out of those areas. And on spruces, same thing. The pattern is fairly scattered. The real issue is stress, and for those of you who are working in landscape maintenance, I guarantee you've seen this. Uh, Usually we'll see a little bit more die back in the bot in the lower canopy first, but eventually you can see scattered branches all the way up and down the tree. And this picture, I like this one because it um, it shows you what what do you think stressful about that site? Pretty much everything, yeah. right? <laughs> yeah. So there's really no space for this large tree. The root space has been compromised with the parking lot. Uh, the tree's probably been there a lot longer than the parking lot, and it just got crowded out. And it's grown a lot, and it, it, there's not space for it. We've also had years of drought, repeated years of drought, and that will impact spruces quite uh, quite a bit and predispose them to this canker. So is the canker disease the real problem or is it the drought stress? It's, it's both, it's both. And this information here, uh, a lot of times we don't get a confirmation on Cytospora canker because we don't get the right material. We'll just get the tips of the twigs or a bag full of needles that have fallen on the ground and you know, just from your friendly local diagnostician, we don't really like that kind of sample. We would like to have the whole branch. We like to have the whole tree, but I don't think we're gonna get that, that one. I have gotten um, whole trees driven up to the lab, and I've had to climb around in the back of the truck and look and see what kind of samples I want, but 
a lot of times, just based on the pattern that, that you're seeing, you can make a tentative diagnosis and feel fairly confident that that's what's going on. Okay, and then one other canker disease that I wanted to make sure uh, that we talked about for those of you who work in landscape maintenance or if you have boxwoods in your nursery, you probably saw this one too, uh, the boxwood canker. It's not the new disease, which I'll talk about in just a, uh, a little bit. There's a new disease of boxwood that we're watching for, but in this, this is an old disease. We see a little bit of it every year. We, see a lot, we saw a lot of it this year because um, we did have that very difficult winter. And the boxwood canker is uh, very much uh, predisposed by, the, um, by winter injury. So symptoms that you would see, again, uh, scattered dieback of sections. And in the top picture, I think you can see a little bit of that uh, reddish brown coloration that's very typical of a little bit of winter desiccation, a little bit of burn. But this would continue to occur throughout the growing season. And that's what we've seen. We've seen a little, we saw a little bit of it at the beginning of the year and some winter injury. And then as the summer has progressed, we've seen more and more of it because the fungus is just really able to move in and take, uh, take over those compromised branches that have a little bit of damage from winter injury. That fungus is able to sporulate and kind of grow on the, um, on the dead foliage as well. And here's a tip. This is something that you should be able to recognize pretty easily. Uh, and using the little proscope or a hand lens, you can definitely see the little, these little bumps on the, um, on the dead twig. And that's the fungal fruiting structure. And they're kind of a pinkish or orange color. So that one's a little bit different looking, pretty noticeable. And notice right here, we have, this is the area right here. Uh, the juncture between the live tissue and the dead, and you can see that that fungus is starting to sporulate from that area. Here it is a little bit closer, sort of an orange, uh, light-colored, buff-colored um, fungal structure. What we also see with boxwood canker is that the fungus is able to act as a saprophyte in addition to causing the dieback or contributing to the dieback of the twigs. We'll see the fungus build up on the backside of dead leaves and that's our source of inoculum for uh, new infections. And what usually happens is those dead leaves eventually will drop down into the canopy and the, you know, boxwoods have a fairly tight canopy and that dead tissue in there has lots and lots of fungal spores attached to it, and that's giving you uh, a lot of inoculum for new infections. So sanitation is pretty important in managing the boxwood canker, and as, as is avoiding winter injury, drought stress, all those things that, uh, that can make those marginally hardy species not do as well. So a lot of our work in the, in the early part of the season would be cleaning out this, these dead tips and also the foliage that's fallen down into the, into the canopy. And I just wanted to mention this since, you know, we've got to keep an eye out for it. The boxwood blight disease, how many of you have heard of that? Most of you or some of you? Uh, boxwood blight, it's a, it's a new disease for the U.S. as of a few years ago. And it's different from the boxwood canker. So I just wanted to show you, yes, you can recognize that this is something different. And if you see it, we probably want to get a, a, a look, at the, um, look at it under the microscope. But as opposed to the scattered dead branches of boxwood canker, which I think is probably very familiar to most of you, um, the boxwood blight is very large circular leaf spots. They may look a little bit like the spots you get from leaf miner in boxwood, but it's not. You can, if you look closely, you'll see that it, there is a difference. These large circular spots with that halo around them, what's that make you think of? It's fungal diseases, sometimes will have a halo, also bacterial diseases, but sometimes fungal diseases will have that. And we see on the leaves and on the twig, a sort of feathery fungal growth. Now, I wouldn't expect any of you to definitely feel sure if you saw fungal structures and you think, okay, well, is this the boxwood blight or is this the boxwood canker? It's just, it's fine to realize this is something and I maybe should get it looked at. Um, and those spots are gonna be very noticeable. And defoliation is a really big uh, 
a key feature to this disease as opposed to the boxwood canker where the leaves stay attached for a longer period of time. So just keep an eye out for this. We haven't confirmed it in Kentucky. Uh, there's several states that have seen a little bit of it this year, but we're just kind of watching for that. So if you see anything strange on boxwoods, uh, let us know. Okay, so a little bit back to our whole plant assessment. We've talked about the foliar symptoms and how they can lead us to look for infectious diseases. Uh, what if we see other types of symptoms though? If we see leaf scorching, wilting, yellowing, thinning of the canopy, other types of symptoms besides those discrete blotches and spots that I've been talking about. Then we're going to focus on problems that can be lower down. Uh, and these tend to be probably the more common problems in uh, certainly in landscapes and um, maybe a little bit more difficult to diagnose. So if we see leaf scorching, burning around the edges like that, we're gonna look for a problem that has to do with water uptake and movement rather than a fungus attacking the leaf directly. And here's a, just an example that I had from last year. It's not something that really we would uh, tend to worry about very often, but uh, it's mimosa wilt, but it is a good example of a wilt disease. If we're, again, seeing scattered branches yellowing and dying back, we check for cankers, we look for those localized dead areas, we don't find them, and then we're gonna look a little bit further. We're gonna look uh, sometimes the inside of the branch as well as the outside. And in this case, with a foliar, um, with a vascular wilt disease, we can see discoloration inside the branch in the in the xylem. So that is a, that's going to be a little bit more uh, invasive to figure out what's going on. But if you're running out of options, you don't see those first ideas, looking for cankers, looking for leaf spots, uh, and you check the uh, the area around the root collar. You don't see anything, this is something maybe to, to take, a, take into account would be a vascular wilt. And there are lots of different fungi that cause vascular wilts. So again, foliar symptoms, we talked about needles, their they're leaves too, and we'll, we're seeing browning, we've looked at them with a hand lens, we don't really think we see those uh, little structures, or maybe you're not sure, sometimes it's hard. If we want to submit a sample for diagnosis to the county extension office, uh, which sometimes comes to the lab, if you're not sure and you're seeing those, that pattern of all over dieback, wouldn't it make sense to probably think about the possibility of a root uh, disease or something lower down as well as the foliar disease? And this is just a little plug for getting good samples into the lab. Um, see, you can see there that a root sample was included with this one, and sometimes that's very helpful to us. And so uh, along that line, uh, root diseases. These are a couple of plants that were both infected with Phytophthora root rot. Everybody heard of Phytophthora root rot? Nobody has? Uh, it's probably our biggest, yeah, <laughs> uh, it's, it's probably our biggest uh, root disease in landscape plants that I see, uh, especially on taxis, on cherry laurel, we see it all the time. Uh, certain of those foundation plants that people really like, they're very susceptible to Phytophthora root rot. And Phytophthora is a water mold, so it's very much tied in with wet soils and poor drainage. Now this plant, I think anybody would recognize, okay, that's dead, that's where you know you wanna write the diagnostic report, it's dead, but really we wanna know why. And in this case, this was Phytophthora root rot. So that's an overall browning and dieback, wilting, those are the symptoms to look for. But this plant was a, was a good call on the, on the landscapers part because it's just showing that little um, slight yellowing, that slight fading, a little bit of wilting. And that's something to keep an eye out for because Phytophthora and most of our root pathogens will spread in irrigation water. So we wanna make sure that we're um, watching for these just slightly symptomatic plants rather than waiting till everything's dead because then we might be able to put a management plan in place to prevent this uh, really dead tissue. When we're trying to make the diagnosis with Phytophthora, we're gonna see that overall browning, yellowing, wilting um, of, the, of the whole plant. And then when we 
when we remove plants, we, would, we have to look at the roots in order to confirm it, and you would probably want to do that too. And usually you'll see sort of a reddish brown discoloration at the base. I don't know if that's very clear on that, but uh, usually right at the collar or just below, you'll see a, a reddish or cinnamon brown discoloration. Uh, just below the bark, and that's a good, a good indicator. Sometimes it's not very visible. Uh, Phytophthora is a good one to get a lab confirmation just so that you know what's going on. And here's a couple of slides I wanted to show you about selecting sample material and also just looking at the pattern that you're seeing when you're trying to figure out what's going on. So here's a new uh, installation of Taxus, and we see the problem one the dead one that hasn't, hasn't lasted very long. Where, where else, if we wanted to um, send a sample to the lab for confirmation, the dead one would, would be okay. But what else, or what, where do you think we all should, also should sample or what would get your attention if this was a landscape that you were working in? One more down this way. A little bit further down. Like that one, it's starting to look a little thin. This one is right next to the thin one. It's between two that are showing symptoms, so that one might be a good one to, to focus on. Um, if we get a confirmation on this one, we can pretty much guarantee that the, that one, the, the adjacent plant's probably already infected and a treat you can sometimes use a drench in a landscape to treat those, but a lot of times we want to think about the bigger picture. Why do, the, why do the plants look okay on this side? And then we're getting this, this pattern here. It's a water mold. Phytophthora has to have wet soils. So it's a little hard to tell from the picture, but there's something going on about this side of the planting that is getting wet and staying wet longer. So that's the bigger issue is figuring out, okay, I've got a drainage problem that I've got to address. And another one I just wanted to show you that we did a little study on Phytophthora in the beginning. We, we collected plants that were just completely dead, showing those typical symptoms to, to confirm the disease. But we also had, this was one strip of uh, shrubbery around the parking lot. The adjacent strip of plants really wasn't showing symptoms. They were looking pretty good. So we did some testing anyway on, on the roots of those. And these were essentially asymptomatic, but they were adjacent to the, the dead plants. And within the, the next three years, that's this row, completely gone. They all, they all came out. And that's, again, look at, the, look at more than just the symptoms on the plant, look at the site. It's a par parking lot where basically those plants were the erosion control and, and the, the water break. And they didn't like all that, that moisture. They were just having water co constantly sheeted onto that area. Okay, so which, which leads me to remind you, not only do you need to look at the symptoms close up and the, look for signs if you can see them, uh, also you want to investigate what's going on in the environment and the cultural history, especially for those of you in landscapes, but um, in the nursery, you're gonna have a lot, actually a lot more information, a lot better information to know what's going on in your nursery. So you have even more tools to work with when you're thinking about all of the, the background information. And this is also important when you submit samples for diagnosis, because we need to know the background information too. So things about how the transplanting occurred, when it occurred, regrading, things like that with a parking lot would be, uh, Definitely an issue that can that can cause water to stay in the uh, in the soil too long. Recent weather, weather further back too. We have to think in years, not just days, with our um, with our perennial crops like trees and shrubs. And then certain diseases, you know, the environment really is everything. I just I always like to use this picture because um, this is a new landscape, and we did a study in it. We handpicked it for a Phytophthora study and everything had it, of course, because I think uh, anybody's gonna realize this is, not, this is not a good setting for, for plants and it doesn't matter so much that an infectious disease with it was there, it matters that the drainage is a disaster and that's, that's really what needs to be uh, focused on. 
Okay, so I want to spend just the next few little minutes, I think I've got a little bit more time, to talk about uh, pictures and show you some, our little gadgets. Uh, but first of all, this came in just before this meeting, and so I added it in, and I thought this was perfect, my love-hate relationship with di digital images. Um, because it, working in a diagnostic lab, I'm, I'm trained to dissect the plant, find that little fungus, uh, put it on a slide, measure the spores. That's that my training is in mycology, and that's what I want to be doing. And, and it's been a real interesting uh, journey for me to realize that that's not always possible, and I'm going to have that I have to rely quite a bit on the grower or the client to fit to give me the information that I need. And it's, that's written information or verbal information, and it's also pictures. Things I love about being sent pictures uh, to base a diagnosis on. Um, the big picture, the context, showing something like this. The, you know, a, the top branch of one of those shrubs is not going to tell me very much. A picture like this tells all of us everything. We're, we're pretty clear on what's going on there. So the big picture, it gives you the context. It shows you the site as well as tells you the site. Uh, it also can show us the whole plant with trees and shrubs. This is really helpful, and I'm sure you all can appreciate that. It's very hard to make a, a diagnosis. I'm sure you're, you're asked to do this kind of thing based on one little leaf or a twig tip or something like that. Uh, very nice to be able to at least visualize the whole plant if we can't have the whole plant to look at. And we also have really a lot better equipment than we did uh, you know, six months ago even. <laughs> it's changing so fast. Uh, we have better cameras, we have better equipment, and they really can give us much better images, including the close-ups, which I'll show you uh, in just a second. Now, there are some things that I hate, though. Poor quality pictures are the ones that I really hate. Um, and that is strangely prevalent. Uh, not looking to see if it's in focus before you send the picture because you know I I can't <laughs> I can't tell if it's blurry I can't tell what what it, what it is either so uh, poor quality pictures are the biggest waste of time and so just you know I'm not going to get too fussy about that but um, also pictures you just like with actual samples, physical samples, and information that people tell you, there's always the risk that you're gonna miss that critical picture, that one picture that's gonna show you the missing piece. And that's with diagnosis in general. And that's something that you all face too, I'm sure, when you're asked about different things. If you're not there in the site and really looking at everything, it's a little bit more difficult to figure out what's that missing piece, and pictures don't necessarily fix that. And also another th little trend that I've seen lately is uh, people that have little gadgets uh, sending pictures just of a, of a close-up, and I have no idea what it is because I don't have any context. So that's something you want to avoid uh, doing as well to keep your, your di local diagnostician happy. <laughs> so here's one, that I, a little case study, and I'm, I'm going to be quick with this. But this was an email that I got. I've taken out the names. And it's not, and really, it's, it's not so bad what I, what I got, but it did give a good illustration of some of these problems. So he's sending me pictures of some maples. They're in a line with one another, and that may or may not be helpful uh, information. Uh, we've got pretty much a dead tree with a few stunted leaves, one that's about 75% gone, give or take, uh, but the leaves that are there are distorted. Another that's about 50% of the canopy also seems to be declining. A uh, homeowner says they had sprayed weed killer. We don't know what that means or where it was sprayed or anything about that, so it's good to know that. Uh, and there are some other species that are not showing any of the symptoms, and that's good, helpful information. So maybe this is a s problem specific to maples. Uh, we don't know yet until we see the pictures. And then he, thank you for saying, you may need to send a sample in. Well, you might, we'll see. Okay, here's the pictures that I got. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> that one, I have no idea because it's focused, the, the distorted leaves, I can't see them because they're blurry. So that one's out. Um, this one is dead. Yeah, I agree with that. Just dead. This one's too dark. 
and I can't really see anything, although I can see that that's the one, I guess the 50% canopy. So we've got some dye back from the tips. This one's, this one's the first one that's a little bit helpful actually because we can think about when we're talking about the patterns, this is a pattern of dye back from the outside moving in. Usually that means vascular problem, root problem, environmental problem, rather than a foliar disease, which usually is working its way up from the bottom. So we probably have something environmental going on. I kind of figured it, that out from that picture too. Uh, we got this one, these are the distorted leaves. Dave, you got any ideas on that one? I'm not sure. Looks a little bit like um, the potato leaf hopper to me. But it's a picture, so I don't know. I'm not looking at it, but anyway, a little bit of distortion, not sure about that. Uh, that's no good, because I have no idea what that picture is supposed to be of. And this one shows you a little bit of a different kind of distortion, but there's no context, so I'm really not sure what's going on with that one. So he did a lot of work, and I'm not uh, trying to be mean to this, this person, <laughs> hopefully he's not in the room. Um, but really, I think it really ex it exemplifies all the, the difficulties of looking at pictures. We can get a little bit of information from them, but to, to spend the time to take six pictures and send them to me, and they don't really show me very much. You know, let's, let's just try to think like a diagnostician, and that's what hopefully uh, we're all gonna do, and really think about what kinds of pictures are actually gonna support a diagnosis and what are gonna be just throwaways. Can um, you talk about verticillium rope on that? I definitely think that's a possibility with this type of picture. This one, this one is helpful. Uh, I wouldn't be able to determine that without a physical sample, so his, idea of maybe send one in. Also, if this is uh, insect injury, or if it's chemical, I think there's some question, they're kind of wondering about chemicals because they said something about weed killer, we've got a little bit of distortion. I, I just don't think that, uh, uh, I don't know what kind of weed killer is going to do that. I, I mean, some yes, I do know some of them. Chris, um, <laughs> Chris you might want to comment on that. But really, an overall dead tree, completely dead maple, what do we think? What's the first thing we're gonna think of this year? Okay, I wanna see, I wanna see the picture that's taken right here and maybe on the back side. Um, I wanna know, well, I wanna know if there's, if, if this thing got injured last winter and the winter before, and if we have die back on the, if the whole, if the bark is falling off the whole back of that tree, uh, because sometimes we'll see that kind of thing, this, you know, Yes, verticillium wilt last year or two years ago may have killed that tree just about outright. So I think there's a lot, there's probably several things going on and I think we definitely would want to see a little bit more about what's going on down here. Difficult with samples. From the university, you would probably say it was planted too deep. Well, <laughs> it probably was. <laughs> <laughs> This video has been part of the University of Kentucky Nursery Crops web series. For more information on the topics discussed, please contact your county extension office.